Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome to Atava's um, product info session. Sorry for the little bit late reply. I just want to move my computer a bit. Okay. Um, today we're going to talk about honey. Um, so I myself am a, um, a honey farmer. Um, and I just want to tell you a bit about how honey works, how it looks, um, some frequently asked questions that I have. So I've made a small slide um, show for you. Let's start here. Okay. So you all know me from Atava, um, but some of you also know that I am the owner of Simpson Raw Honey. And yeah, I've been selling, buying and selling honey since 2014. It's been quite a few years, but only in the last two years or so have I been starting to, to farm with my own hives. And it takes really a long time to get them established, um, especially in the drought that we've had um, in South Africa the last couple of years. Um, so before that, I was actually just buying honey in bulk um, bottling it and reselling it. So yeah, I get honey from all over South Africa and it's really um, just an amazing industry. Um, bees are amazing creatures and I'm going to just really touch on the bees today because I just want to tell you a little bit about bees because um, this is not a beekeeping um, talk, but if you, if you read up on them, it's just, we can learn so much about them, um, from them. They are very hard working. They're one of the, the, the insects that really literally work themselves to death. Um, and they are extremely intelligent. Um, yeah, but nonetheless, let's start with, with the presentation. So I've decided to call today's talk the golden miracle because honey is really a miracle and it has a dual purpose for humans um, it has it functions as food um, a very healthy food but it's also medicinal um, in its uses uh, just trying to go on in the slide mm. Sorry. Huh? Let me just open the PowerPoint. Sorry, I'm having just a little bit of technical issues with the PDF. It doesn't want to just. This morning is just a bit crazy. <laughs> um, okay, let's see if it's better now. No, it still doesn't want to continue. Sorry, guys. Just need to figure this out. Usually it works so easily. Okay, while I'm waiting for the power bit of the point to, to open, um, I'm just going to start 
talking. Let me see if it's open. It never rains, it pours. Sorry, the computer is taking so long. Um, okay, I'm just gonna start. If I see, okay, there it goes. Yay. So let's quickly try. Um, Okay. Yay. So now you can see the slides. Um, it's a bit slow to react, but yeah, just please be patient. <laughs> so in South Africa, there's many, many thousands of species of bees in the world, um, of which I think a total of 70 or seven producers honey. It's, it's really not a lot. And there's even some wasps that um, produce honey. Um, and in South Africa, um, we have two subspecies. So in the south of South Africa, you get the Apis mellifera um, capensis. So it's the Cape honey bee. Um, and they don't mix well. <laughs> okay. And then in the north, um, where I live as well, we get the Apis mellifera scutellata. So the scutellata is the bees that I farm with. Um, they are very similar in, in, in farming and producing honey. So we can use the same hives and all the same things uh, for the two different species. But the problem is, and it has happened in South Africa and it's kind of a problem. So I think before people realized um, that, that um, these two, two subspecies can be a threat to each other, they, they brought some of the Capenzas bee over the natural borderline. Um, so they are currently present in the north. And what happens is um, it's only the queen bee that can lay eggs um, in a bee swarm, in a bee hive. So the queen will lay the eggs and then you have the worker bees that are also female. Um, and she, the queen produces a pheromone that says I'm queen and they know this is the queen. And so they will feed and only she will lay eggs. But with the capenzas, what happens is um, their queens have a very strong pheromone. So when they come in contact with the scutellata, they don't react to that queen's pheromone. So they will all start, all the worker bees will start laying eggs. And then there's no queen and those eggs are not fer fertile. And in the end, the whole hive will die out. So it is quite a problem. So when one of your hives get um, capendous bees in, um, yeah, usually the whole, the whole hive, the whole swarm dies out. So it is kind of a big problem. We try not to, to mix those two subspecies. What's also interesting, the South African honeybee is known for its quality of honey and um, for being very hardworking, but they're also aggressive. They are one of the most aggressive bee species. And it was actually for study reasons that they took some of our honeybees over to America where they crossed them with their bees and that swarm got out. And then they started to, to breed and multiply. And that's where what the Americans call the killer, killer honeybee. But it's actually just the African honeybee. Um, they do make very good honey, but they are aggressive. And if a swarm, um, I don't know why, but sometimes when the pheromone of the queen is a lot stronger than it's supposed to be, the bees can be more aggressive and yeah, people, people can die from, from these things. Mm. What's also interesting is the, there are many countries that didn't have bees um, 
like Australia didn't have bees, they were also introduced by people. And in Australia, currently you get the Manuka honey that's very famous for its healing properties. But like I've said previously, there were no bees in Australia. So since bees was introduced there, now they can produce that honey that's from extremely high quality. So those are the two species. Okay. So you get three different cases of bees. So case is, is a term that's used when you have the same um, gender of an insect, but they have different roles. So this is not 100% correct because the drones are actually not um, female bees, but you get basically the queen. So the queen bee is a lot bigger than the other bees. She's the only one that can lay eggs and she has the longest lifespan of anything from one to eight years. Then you get the drones. So the drones are the male bees. Um, so whenever they want to, um, if maybe a swarm gets too big and they want to split and form a new swarm, then the queen will lay eggs specifically in knowing it is a, a male egg. So that's one of their amazing intelligent designs. She can actually decide if she wants to um, create male or female bees. So she will lay eggs that are male bees um, and they live about 21 to 38 days to drones. And she will also maybe they will produce a new queen and then when the queen hatches the drones will also leave the hive together with the new queen and they will go up in the air and they mate very high up in the air. So the drones are the male bees and then you get the worker bees. So the worker bees um, are all female. And that must be very obvious because they can work very, very hard. Um, so worker bees can live from a couple of days up to 150, 40 days. Um, it's depend, it depends on the circumstances, uh, the season. Um, usually in some seasons they last longer or live longer but literally they sometimes can work themselves to death. They work extremely hard, like I will show you today. So the worker bees, the female bees, they go through five stages of work. Um, as they grow, it's called age polytheism. Um, and it's divided basically into three fields in the hive. It's called, um, the either are busy with brood activities, looking after the larvae and the young bees, or it's called nesting or nest activities having to do with making honey and looking after the nest, the nest or the hive um, and then also field activities. So to just quickly show you the, the five stages. So as soon as they get out of the cell and when the larva is matured and it's a, it's a young bee, um, they are a cell cleaner for three days. So the main job is then to clean cells of any extra food that maybe the larvae hasn't eaten or any debris that, that might be in the cells and then also cap the capping of cells. So they produce and use wax and um, when they store honey in the honeycomb, when the honey is cooked, when it's ready, when that cell is full, then they will cap the cell. They will close it off with wax. So you can easily see when you take um, out one of the frames out of a beehive, you can easily see if, if the frame is ready to harvest because you can see if all the little cells have little caps on. It's like a, a thin layer of wax that covers the cells. Then you get, um, after that, from day three to six, you get nursing bees. Um, so their main purpose is feed, feeding the older larvae. And then from day six to 13, they also start to feed the queen. So bees also produce royal jelly. They have glands in their abdomen, and then they will start at this age, those glands are fully mature, and they will start producing royal jelly, which they will um, feed to the queen. So royal jelly is also harvested, and it's a very 
healing, very amazing product, but it's very expensive because obviously it's not produced um, in mass quantities and it's difficult to harvest. And what is amazing, um, I don't know if you all know anything about epigenetics. So epigenetics is the link between your, um, your diet, your um, circumstances, your environment and your health, your DNA and how that has an impact and can change your DNA. So um, what is amazing is all the bees in a, in, a, in a swarm, in a hive, let me just put some light on you. All the bees in a hive have the same exact DNA because the queen is the mother and she just lays eggs and they're all the same. So a queen's DNA is not different than that of a, a worker bee, even though she's a much larger bee. Um, her DNA is activated and changed to become fertile and bigger just by what she's fed. So it's actually the, the royal jelly that she's eating that makes her so fertile and makes her bigger than the other bees. But on DNA level, it's exactly the same. So epigenetics is like extra markers and extra traits that's turned on by, um, by food. So it's a very good example of how epigenetics work um, if we look at bees. Then the third stage they go through in the hive, the working stage, they become a comb builder, or it's where they are working on the nest. So that is basically for 10 days from day 10 to 20. This will include um, building the, the frames, the wax, um, and building um, yeah, the structure of the, of the hive. It will be cleaning out any debris, dead bees that have died. They will take them and remove them from the nest. Um, I've also read, which is very interesting, that they only allow sick or very young bees to defecate inside the hive because it can become toxic. So they will also clean that out. But as soon as the bee is a bit older and it can fly out um, of the hive, they will all go and defecate outside of the hive to minimize the toxins inside. Um, it will also include, um, you get a, bees also make propolis. So propolis is, um, I don't know if you've ever seen in the spring when, when big trees like um, an oak tree, when the new leaves start forming on the ends of the, the branches, it makes like a sticky substance. So that sticky substance, the, bee, the bees um, collect that and they mix that with honey and wax and it's called propolis. Um, and they use that to fill gaps in the hive to, you know, to protect the hive from any um, intruders. Um, sorry, I just see these people waiting to be admitted. And um, what they also use that for is to fasten the, the frames. So let's say you have frames in the box. So to fasten the frame so it can't move, they will use that stick and, a sticky substance to, to basically glue it to the, to the hive frame. Um, they will also seal the lid of the hive, um, again, to just minimize um, intruders. And at the front of the hive, there where the bees are entering, Usually you get, they call it a entrance reducer. So it's a piece of wood you put in there that only has a small opening, two small openings for the bees to enter. So you can buy that extra and put that into your hive. And then I don't have that for all of my hives. And when I did an inspection, I saw that the bees closed that by themselves using propolis. They closed that, so there's only two small openings. So yeah, they're very clever. And um, propolis also is of high value. It's also harvested and used in, uh, for medicinal purposes, also for beauty in beauty products. It's very, very healthy um, for your skin. So um, yeah, one of the other functions of the cone builders is to, to ripen the honey. So they ripen the honey in their stomachs. They, um, they get the, the nectar from from the, the field bees, the field bees come in, they regurgitate the nectar and they give it to the comb builders and the comb builders will cook the honey 
in their stomachs and they will put it into the, um, the little cells and they will cap it. So yeah, they've, they are doing all the hard work that um, happens in the hive. Then about from anything from day 13 to 20, they become gardening bees. So as you know, <laughs> bees have stingers. Um, it's very, very painful when they sting you. I've been stung a couple of times. Um, and luckily I'm not allergic to, to, to bee venom. Um, and as you, most of you will know that bees, um, when they sting you, they die most of the time because their little stinger will get stuck in your skin or in your clothing. And when they try to get away, it pulls out all of their intestines, their abdomen pulls out. Um, and that's you know, why they die. So they can only usually sting once. Um, but yeah, then they are the guarding bees. So um, usually one will notify the rest of the hive that there's an intruder and they will secrete a pheromone and everybody will know this danger and they will start attacking you. Bees are quite, can be actually quite um, timid and they're not always aggressive. Um, it really depends from swarm to swarm. Like I've said, you get sometimes get swarms that are very aggressive and usually that's because the queen has a very potent pheromone. So sometimes beekeepers will then remove that queen and replace her with another one. Um, okay, let's move on. <laughs> so the fifth stage of labor for the worker bees. Um, oh, sorry, the last thing I wanna say about the guarding bees. So during this stage, um, the main function is guarding and ventilation. So ventilation meaning um, they use their wings to stabilize the temperature in the hive. So what is amazing, they can actually make it either warmer or they can make it colder in the hive. They can, you know, stabilize and keep it at the same temperature. I've also read what was very interesting. You get a specific type of bee, I think in Asia, that makes it, I think it's called the giant um, honeybee or something like that, but they're not actually that much bigger. <laughs> But they make their hives on rock cliffs or on in big trees um, and they don't build hives inside of hollows inside of a tree stump it will be exposed so to keep the hive warm they will they will be one stage for the worker bees to just the job is just to cover the hive they will just sit on the outside and move their wings to to keep either the hive cool or hot depending on what time of day it is. But what I've also read is there's a, a wasp in that same country that attack the um, honeybees. Um, they are not, these wasps are not sensitive to the venom of honeybees. So even though the, the bees will sting them, they, nothing happens to them. So they will kill the bees, they will take the wax, they will take the honey, they will take the lava. So what they have done to protect themselves or how they've developed to protect themselves against these wasps. So usually the wasps will send out one wasp to go and look for beehives and bee swarms. So then the wasp will see, okay, here's a, a bee swarm and it will go back to the rest and will tell them I found bees and they will come in a swarm and they will attack the hive. So what they've done when they see a wasp near or close to the nest, the bees will go, the, the guard bees will go and they will form a ball around, um, they will cling to each other and literally form a ball around the wasp and they will fly like that and they will start um, um, vibrating and using their wings to generate heat and it will go well above 40 degrees and they literally cook the wasp alive and it dies. So that wasp cannot go back to the other wasps to say, um, where the, the hive is located. So I found that very interesting. So yeah, the last stage, working stage, is then the field bees. So during the guarding, the previous one, the bees also start to fly out in practice sessions. At a certain time of day, you will see a lot of young bees going out, and that's also why they do the ventilation, it's to make their wings stronger so that when they become field bees, that they can fly long distances. 
So they will start exercising their wings. Um, so from day 18 to 28, they become field bees. And even in the field bees section, you have scouting bees and you have foraging bees. I don't know if any of you have ever watched the animation called um, A Bee's Life, um, no, a Bee Movie. Yeah, I, I just love that movie. It's so funny. It's, it's definitely worth a, a watch. Um, but with the field bees, you get scout bees and foraging bees. I'm not sure how they decide that or how it happens, but you become one or the other. So you're not both and they've got different jobs. So the scout bees go out and they go and look for food. They go look for flowers. Maybe somebody's having a, a kid's party and there's cool drinks standing out. They will go look for food. They will spot the food. They will go back to the hive and they will do a little dance. And they will exactly tell the other bees, the foraging bees, where the food is, how far they must fly, how much food they must take, if they must go out over a mountain, um, exactly the direction, even to the meter, they will tell them where they can locate um, the specific food that they've seen. And then the foraging bees will go out and they will either go collect pollen or nectar, propolis, um, yeah, or even water. So that's the four things the foraging bees collect. Oopsie. Sorry, let me just go back. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so I've, quick, I've quickly just named all of those. So all of those, the things um, that the foraging bees collect, um, oopsie. Sorry, somebody's um, microphone is on. Just see if I can mute it. Okay. So pollen, um, the pollen is used, is gathered from flowers. The pollen is used in the in the hive for the brood to, yeah, to lay eggs and to grow. So if there's no pollen, then the the, the brood or the the swarm doesn't grow and and become more. A healthy hive need about 20 to 40 kilograms of pollen a year. That's a lot of pollen. Um, and they've, through experiments, um, they've um, seen that one bee in one flight that goes out to gather pollen um, visits about up to 100 flowers to make its little pollen sacs full. So it's really <laughs> a lot of work and a lot of flowers just in one flight and they will fly a lot of kilometers in one day. So the pollen is gathered um, in little basket kind of structures that's situated on the hind legs um, of, the, of the bee. And it's very cute when you, when you go sit at a hive and you watch the entrance, you can actually see the, the worker bees coming in that's carrying the pollen. It looks like they are wearing little yellow or orange pants. The whole leg is like yellow orange, you can see it very clearly. So they will then come back and they will give that to the, the comb builders um, and they will mix the pollen with a bit of honey and they will store it in some of the cells. And we call that um, honey bread. I think that's what they call it, I'm not sure. But they use that yeah, to live from as well. It's also harvested by beekeepers and sold. It's also quite expensive and it's very, very healthy. But a lot of people is allergic to pollen. Um, that's one of the reasons why people are allergic to honey because that pollen can also be found in the honey itself. Then the, the field bees also collect nectar. Um, they can carry about 50 to 80% of their body weight in nectar. So they suck up the nectar and it goes into their abdomen. They've got a honey stomach. And if you watch also very closely, you can actually see if a honeybee comes in and it's got a full nectar stomach because it's kind of see-through and it hangs at the bottom of its abdomen. It's really swollen. Um, so it will regurg regurgitate that and give it to the, the younger bees that will cook the honey. 
So again, depending on what nectar is available in the area, it will have different colors, different tastes, different smells. Um, also to, to produce, um, to fill their stomach with nectar, in one flight they will also visit up to 50 to 100 flowers, depending on how much nectar the flowers produce. Not all plants have the same amount of nectar, um, and if you farm with bees, um, it's always good to look at the ratio between nectar and pollen. So if you have, um, for example, eucalyptus trees are favorite for, for beekeepers, it's because the flowers of the eucalyptus tree produces a lot of pollen and a lot of nectar. So the bees can get both from one flower. Then a hive, they can use in the summer a lot of liters of water per day. So it's always good to have your bees um, near water because water is also one of the main um, ingredients of the honey itself. And I've already told you a little bit about the propolis. So enough about that. Um, okay. So what is raw honey? Why is that different from processed honey? I think that's an important point that I just want to educate you on today. Because um, many, you know, many of the honey that we see in the stores today is processed honey. Um, some of it's even imported from overseas and it's not good quality honey. But if you learn to see the difference, it's really easy to spot. So raw honey is not filtered or pasteurized. Um, but a misconception is many people will read that if you see honey that looks like syrup, it must be processed, so don't buy it. So that's a bit of a misconception because it's not always true. And um, fresh honey is always in a liquid form. So if we extract honey, maybe even for the couple of months, again, it depends on the different nectar. So um, nectar or honey has glucose in it and fructose. The more glucose is in honey, the faster it will crystallize. So it's not a, there's not a set time, but it can sometimes be liquid for quite a while. So it either means it is processed honey or it can mean it's just fresh honey that has not set yet. So many beekeepers will wait until the honey is set before they sell it, but not all of them. We sometimes get set honey in and then we will heat it up to 40 degrees. So it just becomes a bit liquid again so we can bottle it easier. Then it will set quite quickly again because you don't, if it's under 40 degrees, you don't destroy the crystal structure of the set honey. So it sets quite fast, um, maybe a day or two or a week, then it will be in a soft set again. But if it's fresh honey, it will take a bit longer. So if you buy honey from me and you see it is liquid, it will set over time. It's just because it, it is fresh. So the honey in the hive is liquid because it's very hot in the hive. So the average temperature in a hive is between 32 and 36 degrees and the bees keep it um, at that temperature. If it's colder, then they will heat up the hive because it's just the healthy temperature where the brew does very well. And also I think it's easier to work with the wax and the honey when it is in a, in a softer form. So honey is extracted via gravity and that's why we call it cold extracted. Um, you do get extraction processes where they heat the, uh, the frames um, or the honey to get more out of the, the um, cells. Um, but we don't do that. So basically it's just like a big drum where you put the frames from the honeycomb with the honeycomb into the, the drum and you use this, um, a sling to turn the drum and it uses gravity to basically swing out the honey. Um, so it's totally a cold process. So I always look for that on a, on a label that it must say um, raw and it must say cold extracted. So, um, yeah, so a lot of companies um, heat the honey after this as well. They heat it to a certain degree. They will pasteurize it to remove any form, to be safe and remove any form of bacteria, to give it um, 
that syrupy consistency, so it will not crystallize. Um, so when honey does not crystallize, you must know it either has um, glucose syrup mixed into it or it's just been highly processed. Okay, and it will also um, um, will change the color of the honey. It will give you that golden syrup color throughout. But what is the, the main reason why we prefer the raw honey above the process, processed honey is because when honey is heated, it destroys the, the probiotic and the antioxidant qualities of the honey. And that, what is, that is what is good for you. That is why we want to use raw honey. So then maybe it will taste like honey, but it will not give you that benefit. So even though I think honey is still a little bit, um, heated honey is still a little bit, healthier than, than um, sugar. The thing is when you use honey instead of sugar in your coffee or in your tea, the moment you heat it that much, it gets heated, it turns into syrup. So there's actually no difference or the difference is very small, but if you do it for the taste, that's another thing. So if you use raw honey in your food, it's really very important to try to not heat it, to use it, um, at room temperature. So what I will do, for instance, when I make iced tea for my, for, for my son, I will make the iced tea and I will make the iced tea and um, I will let it cool down completely. And when it's cooled down, I will add the honey. So when your honey has set, when it's in a harder form, obviously it will take a bit longer to um, dissolve into the tea, but just be patient, it will. You can just stir it every now and then, but the fact is you will still have all that goodness of the honey in the iced tea. When you add the honey, when the tea is still hot, you will destroy all of that and you will just use it as a sweetener, basically. Okay, so, like I've said, a lot of the imported honey is also mixed with with syrups with glucose or sugar or a sugar syrup to um, just also cheapen the product because honey is expensive and let's say somebody harvests um, 10 liters of honey they will mix in five liters of glucose so it still smells like honey and tastes like honey but now they've got <laughs> um, in more volume to sell at the price of honey, but actually a third of it is actually glucose syrup. So um, I think the safest way is just to, to make sure that who you buy it from, um, local honey is always good if you know the beekeeper, um, but yeah, I don't think, if you see it comes from China, just beware, <laughs> most of the time that will be processed or mixed honey. Okay, so a lot of people also ask me about the crystallization of honey, that they then think it's old, but actually pure honey, um, the fresher the honey is, the faster it sets. Like I've said, it depends on the um, combination of fructo fructose and, uh, and glucose in the honey. So the more uh, glucose there is, the faster it sets, yes. Like I think rapeseed honey is one of the honeys that crystallizes the fastest. Um, but all honey will crystallize. It's a natural process. It's one that you, can, you can't control it. So um, there's nothing wrong with the honey. The structure and the value and the quality of the antioxidants and the probiotics, it all stays the same. It just has a different texture in your mouth. So as many people don't like that. If you don't like the taste of the crystals. I don't like um, big crystals. You can just very gently heat it, not above 40 degrees. So just heat it over a long, slow process and you can just mix it with a spoon and it will become um, soft and, and liquidy again. Then you get creamed or soft set honey. So there's also a big misconception about that. Creamed honey does not contain any cream. Um, it is actually also a natural process that can occur, occur naturally. So most of my honey that I sell is creamed honey. I don't advertise it as that. That's just the way my honey is because I don't control the process. 
Um, so if my honey is not creamed, then I don't have to explain why this batch is not creamed. But most of my honey, I don't know if it's because we live in a cold place, um, that the way it sits here, it just always screams by itself. Um, but that's basically when the honey becomes thick, like all, almost like the consistency of um, peanut butter or buttery. Um, so the only thing is the crystals are so small that you cannot taste them on your mouth and they are consistent. So it gives you that smooth texture. So some people, um, like I've said, sometimes this process happens naturally. Some people will make cream honey and the way they do that, they will take a can of fresh honey and you can add, they call it seed honey. So the seed honey will be creamed honey from a previous batch and you will take some of that creamed honey, you add it to the liquid honey and then you use a creamer. So a creamer is just a machine with paddles on that slowly stirs the honey to ensure that that seed honey that you've inserted, that creamed honey, breaks up and is evenly distributed throughout the honey. And that crystal, crystals in the creamed honey will just affect the crystallization process of the whole batch. So you can do that, but it's a lot of work. And um, like I've said, I've never had to do it. I just, most of my honey just creams by itself. Um, but again, the, con the, the, the value and the nutritional value of the, the honey is exactly the same. If it's raw, if it's creamed, or if it's crystallized, it's all the same. Okay. So then honey also comes in different colors and flavors. And it was quite challenging for me in the beginning because I cannot print a label for every flavor that I sell because it depends on season. It depends on where the hives are standing and to what flowers the bees have access to. So sometimes they have access to more than one type of flower, but maybe it will be predominantly um, eucalyptus. So it's also difficult. People will ask me, but why is this eucalyptus darker than this one? Because maybe, you know, there were other flowers nearby. I cannot guarantee it's 100% eucalyptus flower, but it's what they have most access to. Um, the other thing is that I just want to warn you or just tell you is that if you see or uh, you are proud because you buy someone's honey that says it's organic honey, that's also almost impossible to guarantee. That's why I won't say that um, on any of my honey even if I place it on a farm where they are farming organically, because bees can fly. <laughs> and they can fly very far away. They've even seen in, in, in drought situations where they can fly up to three kilometers to gather food. That's a long way. So, and it's also like the crow flies. So it can be in any direction. It can be over a mountain. So they can have access to other farms where maybe, you know, they do not farm organically. So, when it says organically, organic honey, just take that with a pinch of salt. Um, yeah, we cannot control that. Okay. So a rough rule is um, if, if honey is very light in color, it usually does not have a very strong flavor. So for instance, the lightest honey that we have is when you can get almost pure canola honey or um, the other one is the um what do you call the flower lucerne honey it's almost see-through it's not even white it's almost like see-through honey um so then they don't have a strong flavor like lucerne or alfalfa honey will have like a grassy taste um i've sold canola honey for a long time it's also a very light honey but um it goes sour very quickly so i've stopped getting that and um yeah, it's, um, it's difficult to say. I think a lot of people harvest canola honey too, too early. Then also it's not cooked properly by the bees, so it goes sour. It's difficult to explain. But you, yeah, you get a feel for it. Sometimes you try a new variety of honey. Um, there are varieties that's really not nice to eat. I know people, you know, people's tastes differ, but there's some of it that's really not nice that I prefer not to buy. Um, there's one type of rainbow honey called, um, I don't know what it's called in English, but in Afrikaans they call it seerfire. 
honey is also not a, a, a nice honey. It also gets sour, can get sour, a sour taste. Okay, so the lighter the honey, um, then it's usually a mild taste. And the honey can also have the taste of the flowers. So for example, your nutty honeys like macadamia honey can have a subtle nutty undertone. I really like macadamia honey. I really like sunflower honey, aloe honey. That's all mild honeys. But then you get the darker honeys. You first will get like eucalyptus honey that can have like a citrusy undertone. And then your very dark honeys, uh, some of the fainbos, again, not all of the fainbos are dark, depending on what flowers are in bloom. You get so many different fainbos. So when you see fainbos honey, again, it can be hundreds of different fainbos. But at a certain time of year, you get a fainbos honey that's very, very dark. It's almost like um, caramel, darker than caramel. So the darker your honeys, usually the stronger the taste. Um, it can sometimes have a more uh, taste like molasses. Um, some of the fainbos honey, you can even taste the flower scent in the honey. Um, and again, a rough rule is if the honey is darker, usually it's higher in antioxidants and um, even more uh, better to use for, for wounds and stuff like that. Um, and you can also sometimes taste the fruit in the honey. It's not, it's not true for all the fruit. Some of it is more prominent, like for example, the lychee honey. You can literally taste the fruit. It tastes like a dried fruit. And that's very nice to use again in stuff like um, iced tea because you get that extra fruity flavor. You even get onion honey. Um, but the, the, sometimes it has that overpowering onions taste, which is nice in, in salad dressings or if you're making a sweet savory um, meat dish like sticky chicken wings, you can use onion honey. Um, so there, there are uses for that as well, but sometimes it will lose that onion flavor after a while. Um, but yeah, there's, there's just different flavors of honey. But then you get also people who will mix honey with things. So you will have like a cinnamon honey. And then that usually is literal cinnamon mixed with the honey, a spiced honey. So just to, to explain the difference regarding that. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> Go. So why is honey healthy and what can you use it for? Like I've just said that the darker honey have more active compounds of the plant compounds. So because bees basically use plant material to produce honey, honey is full of active plant com compounds and that is what's healthy for you. Um, it's been used for centuries. Um, it's been used in embalming. There's even a book where I've read that they um, I haven't fact-checked fact, fact checked it, but we have read that they, when Alexander the Great died, he died over 2,000 kilometers from Greece, from home. So in order to get his body back home and to preserve it for it not to rot, they actually put his whole body in a vat of honey and that preserved it. So that is one of the best known um, aspects of honey is that honey cannot go bad. So don't ever worry of buying too much honey. It cannot go bad. It will just be honey forever. They've even found pots of honey in some of the tombs in Egypt, and it was still just regular honey that you could eat. So honey is very high in antioxidants. Antioxidants, there are many different kinds, but it's stuff like um, polyphenols, organic acids, and flavonoids. So all of those things have many health benefits. It can prevent heart disease. Honey, there's many studies that show that honey consumption is very, very good for your heart. Um, it can help with strokes. It's very good for cancer because antioxidants basically removes disease and diseased um, cells from your body. Um, Antioxidants is also very, very good for your eyes and for your eyesight. So it's good for your eyes and it can also lower your um, blood pressure. 
Honey consumption has been shown to improve your cholesterol levels. So it lowers bad cholesterol and it um, increases your good cholesterol. It lowers triglycerides and it can stabilize your blood sugar. So honey has a glycemic end index of 54 to 58, again, depending on the type of nectar that was used by the bees. So um, it doesn't spike your blood sugar. Um, I have in the past, we, when I fasted, when I felt really um, weak and ill, and I just needed something to stabilize my blood sugar, I will literally eat a quarter of a spoon of honey and it will just stabilize my blood sugar and it will last me 24 hours. So it's really a superfood. Um, I think they've worked out that to power a honeybee to fly across the globe once, they will only need like two tablespoons of honey. So it really is one of the superfoods. Um, honey contains phytonutrients, um, which is the good stuff that we get from the plants. Um, honey is very good for a sore throat. So, um, yeah, you must look out. We are busy producing a, a, a honey mixed with some essential oils for sore throat. And I mean, it's a treat for a kid to get um, a spoon of this honey to suck on and it really relieves your throat. They just say, if you want to use honey for a sore throat, it's good to take it in um, last, to not to eat or drink anything after that, so that it will coat your throat um, and basically stay there, the pro probiotics in that. And I think it's also kind of an analgesic. So the other thing about honey is it helps to alleviate allergies. Um, very important. It helps a lot if you can find honey from your region. If you are allergic and you have sinusitis, it helps to get honey from your area because that honey will contain pollen from your area and it will kind of make your body used to that pollen. So when the flowers are then in bloom and you, you inhale the pollen, you will not get a, um, an allergic reaction. Honey has over 27 minerals, 22 amino acids, and 5,000 life enzymes. Okay, so honey is very good for your digestive tract, your digestive health. And I really believe digestive health is um, the beginning of overall health. Um, it's a natural prebiotic, um, and there are studies that, that shows that it fights by by lori bacteria. But again, honey is what they will call um, a royal food. So royal foods are a term used for foods that are good for you, but in small quantities. So you cannot go and eat all cups of honey because high in because it's still sugar, okay? So a high intake of that sugar can actually worsen diarrhea. So it's good to maybe have a teaspoonful of it three times a day. Um, we use a lot of probiotics in our household. We make kefir, which is fermented milk, which is also very high in amino acids, yeasts, um, probiotics. Um, it's so, so important for your body and to be healthy. So we will make kefir and then we will add raw honey, maybe like two tablespoons, some frozen berries and bananas, and we will mix all of that up and we will enjoy that as a breakfast or a dinner. Um, so that's how we get our raw honey in. That's how we eat most of our honey is, is in things like kefir. And then iced tea, like I've um, explained to you. Then another thing um, honey is very good for is a cough suppressant. So there are really a lot of studies that shows, especially in children that are going through um, a sickness and they cough a lot at night, they wake up um, where they've tested honey versus um, a well-known brand of cough syrup where it either works better than the cough syrup or it has the same results. But obviously it's um, a lot healthier for you. So what I really can um, suggest for you is we've been sick 
and my husband one time he was so sick and he tried a lot of different cough medicine and literally none of it worked he just coughed and coughed for months like for two months we've tried everything so i started googling natural remedies for coughing and i got this recipe and it really works okay so you make so the the herb um, thyme is also known as a cough suppressant so i will take fresh thyme from my garden i'll put it in a teapot i will crush it a little bit so the oils are released if you have thyme oil even better <laughs> Or you can just mix thyme well with honey. But if you don't have, you can just make a tea from thyme. And then I will add rebels tea for taste, um, some lemon for taste. And then I will um, just let it seep and get really strong. Then I will mix in some honey. I will let it cool down a bit. So obviously now the honey will be heated. So you will lose some of the good stuff, but it still works. So then I will add some, some honey and then coconut oil. So oil is also very good to suppress a cough. It really just takes that irritated feel out of your throat. And then you drink it and it, it, it sounds a bit weird, but it's actually very tasty. I really did enjoy the taste of it. And when he took the first sip, he immediately had relief um, of his coughing. So if you want to keep all the good stuff of honey, you can actually make a concentrated version of this. You can seep some um, thyme leaves in literally like a teaspoon of um, um what is <laughs> of rebels tea or like i've said if you have thyme oil you can mix the coconut oil the thyme oil the honey and a little bit of lemon juice and you just make like a little mix then you can keep your honey raw and then you can just eat that with a spoon it will really help for coughing Okay, so honey is also very good for your skin. It's very nourishing to just use a mask of it um, every now and then on your face. It will help for breakouts. Um, it's good for, for herpes lesions, for psoriasis, for eczema, for acne. And you can literally just apply um, the honey to your skin. Maybe even if you had sunburned, um, any type of skin irritation. You can put honey on, leave it for a while, and then just wash it off. Um, yeah, it's very good for your skin. Studies has also found that honey, consumption of honey, if you eat a spoon of honey at night, it can help your body to produce melatonin. Melatonin is the hormone that helps you sleep. So it can increase your sleep quality. Um, then the most exciting thing of all for me about honey is the antibacterial and antifungal properties um, of honey and it's because of honey's unique structure that inhibits bacterial and yeast growth and because of these qualities um, honey is has been used for ages to 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 um, heal wounds okay so um, burn wounds scrapes cuts big open wounds um, it's really good to fight that um, infection. So the, the healing power of honey on wounds is twofold. One, because the high sugar content of honey, because of the, um, the hydrogen, uh, hydrogen peroxide in honey, it kills the germs in a wound. So if you did fall and you have an open wound and there are germs present, it will kill those germs. But honey is also very well at stimulating your tissue, tissue to regenerate. So the wound also heals faster. And like I've said, I've also seen studies that shows that honey is an analgesic. So it will lessen the pain on the wound. Um, there's a study that found that that 97% uh, success rate of topical wound treatment, um, especially for people who had diabetic ulcers. Um, there are some people who produce medicinal honey for wounds specifically. Um, the difference is just that honey is radiarized. Um, I think it will destroy a small amount of the good stuff in the honey but it's just for safety reasons because sometimes honey can carry a bacteria that can cause infection. That is kind of contradictory, but it can happen. Um, so you must use it to your own 
um, discretion. I think, um, yeah, the, the chances of that happening is not very high, but you can then buy specific medicinal honey for wound healing. But I think that's still the best option than anything else. Um, we had a dog, um, an Irish Terrier, and we went running one afternoon and he cut open his leg. There was a pole that stuck through one of his um, legs and it made two big tears, two big holes in his leg. So we took him for stitches and the one, the biggest stitch was about five, six centimeters long and it was across his knee. So obviously that's a bad place because there was some skin missing and it was swollen. So it was very tight. So when he bent his knee, the stitches came out. And then we were past the golden time of putting in stitches. So <clears throat> my sister, who is a vet, just advised me to, to just use raw honey. So I used the honey and I couldn't find the photos. I, I looked everywhere this morning. Um, but yeah, I used the, the, the honey on the open wound, just like that. We will put on honey and put on a gauze and then we just um, uh, put the, um, the verband <laughs> over that, okay? And at first we did, I did that just um, twice a day, every 12 hours, and I will just leave it like that. And it healed so nicely. There was not one time when the, the wound made pus. It just stayed clean. The, um, the skin and the, the um, tissue all stayed red. It was just an amazing clean wound um, and it really worked like a bomb. And I was so amazed. And that's where my journey started with, um, yeah, with, with honey and wound healing. The other day, one of my dogs had a fight and the one had a bite wound. And bite wounds can also be, you know, can become very septic. And we also saw that very late when we realized that the dog's foot was already swollen, you know, very big. So um, we washed the wound with salt water and resin water, and frankincense resin water. And we drained all of the etta from the wound. And then I made a mixture of honey and frankincense and mirror oil. And I placed that into, onto the wound and we just closed it. And it was two days and his leg was fine. So um, it really works amazing for, for wounds and burns. Um, so the other reason why it works so well is that honey um, contains hydrogen peroxide, which is a very strong antiseptic. So at one stage, I had that in my emergency kit, just pure hydrogen peroxide, especially for bite wounds. Like when my dogs fight and one bites the other, I will just clean the wound with pure um, hydrogen peroxide. But honey contains that naturally. So it also contains glucose oxidase and it has a low pH level. So what happens is it seals the wound and it releases oxygen from the wound, which increases the, the, the time in which the um, wound will heal. And it also draws out excess water from the damaged tissue, which will obviously then also decrease the swelling. So like I've said, honey does have a low pH level, which makes it acidic. Um, it's the same with lemons, like lemons is also an acid, lemon juice, but when you consume honey or when you consume lemon juice, it's alkaline forming in your body. And that's the big difference or the big reason why honey is also better for you in your diet. Why it's better to give your child a spoon of honey instead of a sweet, because sweets are just pure sugar and sugar makes you um, acidic, it makes your body acidic and bacteria, viruses, fungi, cancer, all of that thrives in a, um, an acidic environment. So when you use raw honey, it will make you alkaline and they cannot thrive in an alkaline um, environment. So it's really, really a good alternative. Um, and then like I've said, let me just see. Okay, let me stop the sharing. Um, the only warning that I can give you is that sometimes you get a bacteria that is present in soil and in dust. Um, it's called oh, Colostridium botulinum. 
okay, <laughs> something like that. So that bacteria can also be sometimes found in raw honey or in honey. That is why they suggest that you do not give honey to children under the age of one, because if they do ingest that honey, um, that bacteria lies in the gut and it will multiply and it produces, the waste it produces becomes toxic for the baby and it causes um, a type of paralysis. The baby will get lethargic, um, it won't move its head, they won't eat or drink. Um, they call the disease botulism. So it's kind of a, a toxicity disease. But the cases per year, per year in America is 110 people that get botulism. And not all of it is from honey. So only 20% of that cases is from honey and glucose or food, um, which is really not a lot. So it's something that's really scarce, but rather to be on the safe side is then not to give honey to children under the age of one. Um, when a child, they, most cases, most children that does get botulism is between, I think, three and six months old. But to be safe, they say, don't give it to a child under one years of age. So when you are older than one year and for, for adults, um, that bacteria is harmless, your immune system and your gut um, has developed in such a way that you can fight that. Um, but again, that's not the only way that you can get botulism. If a baby eats soil or ground or other food that can contain it, like canned meat, canned tuna, um, there are a couple of food that can contain that bacteria, they can also get it from that. Um, so that's the only warning sign I can give you. Um, so that's all the information I wanted to share with you today regarding raw honey and its uses and its benefits. Um, and I would really just want to give you a moment, if anybody of you has any questions, um, it's a good time to ask. Maybe you don't, you know, I don't always think of everything. Um, let's see if there's a, okay, so there's no Q&A. But the chat is open, so if anybody has any questions, um, please ask. Okay. So, um, yeah, um, I hope that um, you enjoyed today, that it was interesting and that you've learned something. Um, I, yeah, let's see. Akita says, thank you for the interesting facts. It's a pleasure. There's so much more I can teach you about bees. Um, but like I've said, it will just <laughs> become a very long teaching. They just amaze me every day. Um, like I've said, especially the different dances that they do to, to explain to the other bees exactly where, um, sorry, where they can locate the food. Um, yeah. Die land die olie vervier, wat is a verband? Um, oh, you mean when I was talking about the wound? So when you apply honey, you put a piece of gauze over that, and over that you'll put a bandage. That's a verband, sorry. <laughs> you put a piece of bandage over, um, over the wound. Always important not to um, put a bandage on too tight. You must never stretch a bandage before you wrap it. You must always roll out the bandage, let it de-stretch basically and then you turn it because then if there's swelling you can cause the blood flow to to be cut off <clears throat> so kita asked where she can get a, um, a hold of the whole session kita we are going we did record this session and we will share the link on atava's um, um, news feed on telegram and also on facebook